Andrew provided a very good context for our <laughs> sermon this morning, but I want to hone in on just a few verses that we will focus in on. So I will be reading from a different version than Andrew. The 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from the New Revised Standard Version. Starting at verse 3. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Would you pray with me? Father God, we ask that you would prepare us for your word, that you would give us new light into your scripture, and that you would help us to bring to life your word in our lives. May Jesus walk in our bodies. Hear our prayer. Amen. How many of you remember our sister Susan? Amen? Okay. When she came to our church, she had spent her entire life in churches, but finally felt the pull of God on her life to change. She was born again. Her baptism was a beautiful moment many of us were able to witness together. The Lord inhabited her, which is awesome. But after a while, she longed for more. We all want more power. Our God is the all-powerful Lord who created everything, and apart from him, nothing was created. We want to reflect the Lord's power in our lives. All growing up, I prayed that God would give me the abilities of Jean Grey on the X-Men to be telepathic and have telekinetic gifts, or maybe to be like Phoebe on Charmed and have premonitions of things to come. I sought active abilities from the Holy Spirit to showcase the Lord's power. Susan received the gift of tongues, and I was stuck with the weak gift of faith. Paul addressed the issue of spiritual giftedness by making three points in today's scripture reading. First, Paul claims that each person who confesses Jesus as Lord is gifted by the Spirit. Second, that all of those spiritual gifts were to be used not for our individual growth, but rather for the betterment of our entire community. And lastly, that all such gifts were equally activated by God's grace. The diversity of gifts in the early church is still evident in the church today. Now, when we call someone gifted, we're usually talking about an ability that lifts up the individual above the rest of us. It implies that the person has greater potential for success, in a particular area of expertise or interest. The gifts that are affirmed are the gifts a society holds in the greatest esteem. Perhaps intellect, athletic ability, sex appeal, leadership potential in our own society today are what we uphold. There are the haves and the haves nots. A hierarchy is formed, but Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that this assertion, this hierarchy, is wrong. He sees that everyone who claims Jesus as Lord as gifted. For the Corinthians, this giftedness of everyone equally, well, 
it seemed a bit far-fetched, to say the least. In their day, ecstatic speech was the most valued and honored of the spiritual gifts. Why? Well, because prophecy and speaking in tongues were already equated with the manifestation of God's power in their earlier pagan lives. Those with the gifts of ecstatic speech were lifted up on a pedestal, honored above the rest. As is the norm, however, with hierarchy comes division and conflict. The gifts of the Spirit were looking more like stumbling blocks than gifts for the Corinthians. Now today, an example of this for us might be preaching on Sunday mornings. We call upon those who have schooling, who have talent or expertise in delivering a sermon on behalf of the Spirit. Those who are gifted to help us understand God's Word. But we need to remember that it is not the preacher or the schooling which does anything. The Holy Spirit is the active player, the one who deserves glory. We can do nothing apart from the Lord. That the Spirit in persons a lay person to preach. There is no force on earth that can stop him or her. We must honor the gifts bestowed upon us by the Lord, not by society. Now, these stumbling blocks, which we call gifts, are the very thing that seem to divide Susan from our congregation. Some believed it was because of the music or the preaching or the inability to be fed by her brothers or sisters. But let's share an honest truth. The difficulties that the Corinthian church faced about 2,000 years ago still faces the church today. Dissension. Susan had been in the shower one day and received the gift of tongues. She began speaking in what she believed to be the language of the heavenly hosts. It was her firm belief that all true believers in Jesus would receive this gift and be able to use it in their hearts to their content. Now, this definitely rubbed me the wrong way because I certainly have never spoken in tongues, yet I knew I was a true brother in Jesus' kingdom. How could one gift be honored above all the rest? Why was my hospitality not equivalent to her tongues? What made her gift so much better than my own? Well, Paul speaks in today's scripture reading of the charismatic gifts of the Spirit, wisdom and knowledge, faith and healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues and interpretation of tongues. But if we were to read a little farther, he speaks of the more ordinary gifts in the text ahead and seems to point to the ordinary gifts of teaching and leading and helping others when he speaks of the varieties of services and activities and gifts in today's scripture. Is this an extensive list of spiritual gifts? By no means. Throughout scripture, we also see generosity, compassion, evangelism, administration, encouragement and service, mercy, hospitality, worship and prayer which are practical gifts of the Spirit that undergird the life of the church and our work in the world. Each gift, whether it's flashy or behind the scenes, is an important aspect of God's work in the world. God pours out his Spirit upon the church in ways that will build up the community, not individuals. If we are seeking the best gifts, we are not honoring what the Lord bestows upon us. We're envying gifts we are not, that which we do not have. Do I envy the gift of prophecy? Unfortunately, I do. But I do not allow that envy to take away from my ability to use the gifts that the Spirit did gift me. Drink up the gifts of the Spirit, my brothers and sisters. Know that the Lord has anointed each of us, not just those of us with the gift of tongues, with oil 
And he has made our cups to overflow. Own the gifts that the Lord has given to you to build up his kingdom on earth. Know that God gave you specific gifts because that's the gift by which others will come to know Jesus through you. Gifts are not merit badges. They're not signs of holiness or approval of the Lord, but rather they're God's response to the needs of our community. Have I always wanted the gift of prophecy? Yes. I have always been interested in knowing what was coming before it happens. But while prophecy is the gift I long for, faith and hospitality are the gifts Jesus offered to me because it's not through prophecy that others will know Jesus through me, but rather through my faith and hospitality. How is Jesus working through you? What are the gifts that God has given to you? These gifts are to be used to build up our community, to help others to know Jesus through you. The gifts are important. The gifts, though, the gifts of the Spirit cannot be separated from the work of Jesus. A Christological confession, Jesus is Lord, functions as a criterion for authentic Christian spirituality. On the other hand, for Paul, no one filled with the Spirit can say, Jesus be cursed. Those who truly are in the Spirit will speak and act in ways congruent with life death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is Lord points to Paul's reliance on the simple and most essential confession of our church. Because Jesus alone is worthy of trust and obedience, no other political or cultural or religious Lord can be the focus of our Christian spiritual interest. All who confess that Jesus in, is Lord is indeed sharing this indwelling spirit. It is faith, no other spiritual gift, that unites all Christians in God's kingdom. Isn't that an interesting concept? God makes it clear that no one can make such a profession of faith that Jesus is Lord in the absence of the Holy Spirit. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. This is an important assurance for us who feel somehow second class due to the gifts the Spirit enables us with. The faithful in the pews Sunday by Sunday are as much inheritors of the Spirit of those of us who are called to preach or speak in tongues, or have gifts of healing. All gifts are important and necessary for the building up of God's people. The moment we begin to hold one gift in higher honor than the rest is the moment we stop allowing the Spirit to work through us. The Spirit knows how we work better than we know ourselves. She gifts us accordingly, helping creation to know Jesus as Lord through each of us. Now these gifts have a definite purpose, the edification of the community. A genuine spiritual gift is not granted to individuals for their own private emotional highs, their own mystical thrills, or for exclusively individual serenity. Christianity is not a religion of spiritual lone rangers or narcissists. Rather than fostering a purely private ecstasy, the gifts are bestowed in order to build up the church. They are intended to be publicly communicable, publicly shared, and publicly enjoyed. We cannot be Christians alone we need the community of one another in order to fulfill God's plan of salvation for all people.
Paul also suggests that the plural nature of these gifts is not an accident. The church cannot be homogenous. The differentiation of talents and experiences in the Christian community is absolutely necessary. The sanctifying agency of God is so rich, so multidimensional, that it requires a variety of expressions. In verses 4 through 6, the same Spirit, Lord, and God are manifested in the multiplicity of gifts and services and activities. The triune deity, who is Spirit, Lord, and God, is a prototype of our unity and diversity through a dynamic kaleidoscope of phenomena that we call gifts. All of our gifts are necessary to bring about wholeness in the world, just as all three persons of the Trinity are necessary to bring about full relationship between creation and creator. <clears throat> Members of the church can help one another to discern our spiritual gifts by noticing and nurturing the potential in another of which that person might not even be aware. Remember that if it were not the, for the members of my youth group in high school, I might never have heard the call of God to become a shepherd of his people. We're often unable to see the very gifts that the Spirit bestows upon us because we don't look at them as gifts. We see them as ordinary. But that which is given to us by the Lord is anything but ordinary. It's extraordinary. Recognize the gifts and the power the Spirit works through your brothers and sisters and remind them of it. It may be you who helps another to work great deeds through their God-given gift. I need to ask you to be real, though. How often do we place people in positions of our church based on what we do for a living? Like, we might ask teachers to help in the education ministry, or we might ask managers to help in the administration ministry, or we might ask younger individuals to get a younger crowd in the church yesterday. Perhaps God is gifting some in ways that are not used in our vocations. Perhaps a teacher would be able to glorify God more fully in the choir, or visiting shut-ins as opposed to teaching in Sunday school, not stretching him or herself out of a comfort zone of teaching. We all need to spread our wings and try new ways to be of service to Jesus. He, he is able to do anything he chooses through you. Be ready. Through your faith, Jesus will move mountains. We, as Christians, are all given gifts to be used for the good of all. What that means is that all of us are called to be involved in ministry. Ministry is not something to be left to the paid staff, but the work of each and every Christian. The Holy Spirit has given you gifts. Yes, each of you. If you are still breathing, if you are still walking, whether with your two legs or with a cane or in a wheelchair, my brothers and sisters, God has you here for a reason. God has given you a gift to use. Do not hold that in for yourself. God does not gift you to edify yourself. God gifts you so you might build up his kingdom, might build up his church, might build a new faithful person. God can use you. God will use you if you allow it. All of these gifts, all of these services, all of these activities are activated by the Spirit of God for his purpose. Each person, Paul writes, is not just is given a manifestation of the Spirit, a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good of all, not just the betterment of ourselves. 
in the culture we live in today, and often within our church itself. Individualism has been exalted to such a high status that the phrase common good has nearly vanished from our speech. Paul's words offer a refreshing, maybe shocking reminder that faith, while personal, is never private, and that the gift each person has been given is meant to be shared with others. Have faith and share the gifts the Spirit has put specifically in you. Let Jesus use you to move mountains. Drink up his Spirit. Amen. Thank you.